Hello and welcome to Memoirs of Successful Women. I'm Annie Gibbons, founder and CEO of Women's Biz Global, and I invite you to kick off your heels, get comfortable, and be ready to receive the golden nuggets that are shared as you listen in to candid conversations I have with fascinating women from around the globe. Business leaders, entrepreneurs, humanitarians, athletes, and a whole lot of regular people. They will keep you riveted as they let their guard down and open up on aspects of their business and life journey, how they measure success, and what they have learned along the way. My intent is that our conversations will inspire you to embrace opportunities and possibilities beyond the limits of your imagination, because I know that this is where we reclaim our power. I want you to reclaim your power, your strength, and vulnerability to stand in your truth and propel yourself towards the life that you dream to live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Women's Biz Podcast. I am your host, Annie Gibbons, and I am thrilled to introduce a fantastic guest today. Her name is Elizabeth Gould. She is a best-selling author, a performance coach, and the innovative mind behind the Success Maximizer Method. She's got 15 years of experience, and she's been empowering high achievers, leaders, and visionaries to reset and optimize their personal success journeys. And you know I'm all about that. She has a groundbreaking book called Feeling Forwards, which was even endorsed by Tony Robbins. And it demonstrates her success in aligning cutting edge neuroscience with practical methodologies for lasting personal growth and achievement. She's been all over the media in major TV networks. She's also a founding member of Randy Zuckerberg's Leadership Institute. And as a PhD candidate and podcast host of her podcast called Feeling Forwards, she continues to delve into the nuances of performance equity excellence and neuropsychology. Oh my goodness, I'm so looking forward to our conversation today. Welcome to the program, Elizabeth. Oh, thank you, Annie. I'm just I'm delighted to be with Women's Biz Global and your tribe today. I can't wait to have a thoroughly good chat. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it and so are our listeners because they love just hearing these intimate conversations that women from around the world have and we are both in Australia today which is just amazing because I never know who my guest is going to be. So I've got a fellow Aussie here for you today, everybody. Now, (laughs) you've developed the Success Maximizer Method which has empowered countless high achievers to just (laughs) level up beyond belief. Can you give our listeners a brief overview of what this method is? and how it actually differs from conventional approaches to personal success. Yes, I'd love to because I developed the method in response really to my high-performance coaching clients because so often they would come to me and they would usually start with what I knew to be the end, but they would would start and say, oh, um, Elizabeth, there's something wrong with my, my willpower. There's something wrong with my motivation. I used to be able to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and work out and do all this stuff and now I just can't I just can't make myself do it do it anymore and it was like they they felt their willpower was broken and the interesting thing about that is really it's it's your behaviors are the last things you need to worry about not the first so I developed this personal success formula which has three chunks and and The first part of it is your aim. The second part is your inner justification. And the third part is your behavior and attributes. So one story I I share to start people off using this formula is I say, look, let's imagine you had to do a really detailed project in PowerPoint. And for some reason, you had to get up at 4 a.m. tomorrow morning to finish it. You, You just had to. Emotionally, how do you think you'd feel about that from a scale of one to ten? And they go, mm, you know, you're usually diligent, driven people that go, oh, about a, maybe a six. If I had to get it done, that has to be done. I'd say, okay, so now let's play with that and say, how about I said to you, you have to get up at 4 a.m. tomorrow morning because I bought you a first class ticket for an all expenses paid seven day trip to the Bahamas. So what do you reckon you're emotional? <laughs> exactly. I had not I had met one person that said they wouldn't go, but 99.9% of people <laughs> find that very appealing. Um, and I said, well, you see, it's the same activity. 
you're still getting up at 4 a.m. in the morning when that clock goes off. Mm. So how about what we look at is how you can generate <clears throat> at least close to the feeling of you're going to the Bahamas when your alarm gets off at 4 a.m. in the morning. Do you reckon then your, you, your willpower would still be broken? They said no. So then I go back and say, well, let's look at what your aim is currently, not your goals, your aim, and then let's uncover what's the inner justification? What's the, what's the burning desire in your heart that's linked to that aim? It's your must-do. Then let's look at how you get up at 4 a.m. in the morning. And mm -hmm. the beautiful thing about this formula is if you're ever out of whack, and it might not be motivation, it might be success, you might not be earning the money you want to, we'll go back to that formula and say, okay, so where's the, where are you less than, it's a 30, 40, 30% split, obviously adding up to 100%. Let's do the formula. Let's see which part is less than 99.9% .9 there, and then let's work on that. So I developed this method in response to really high achievers who got stuck and just wanted to, to really bounce forward. Oh, I love that. I love it when you've done it for a reason because when you're meeting people, working with people, and you're actually untapping uh, how so many different elite success minds work and you realise what their, what their barriers to success are, it allows you to have that, have that depth and really start thinking, oh, my goodness, uh, maybe there is a better way. I know your latest book is called Feeling Forwards and it's received incredibly high praise from leaders like Tony Robbins. So can you share some key insights or strategies from the book that our listeners can then apply to their own journeys on personal growth and achievement? Yes, absolutely. And a lot of a lot of my coaching work was really derived from feeling forwards. And I I was in a, a different situation where I was coaching entrepreneurs um, starting with Zuckerberg Institute. We had entrepreneurs from all around the world going through our programs, but whether they were from the um, Africa or Asia or Australia or UK, the problems were all the same. And they all had what I call a bad case of whenitis, which is um, when my app is downloaded 100,000 times, when my product is in Neiman Marcus, when, 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 then I will get my finances straightened out. I will um, take good care of my health. I'll, I'll get a personal trainer, all of these things. And my first question always was, well, really? Do you think you have more time when you're really successful? Because let me tell you, you have like 10, uh, you know, 10 times less time. But secondly, Sorry. yeah, so it, it, the secondly, it's, it's a little bit like meeting, let's say you meet a, a teenager, friend, son, friend of a friend, whatever, uh, daughter, and you say, what are you thinking of doing? You know, that really boring adult question. What are you going to do with your life? And they said to you, oh, I'm going to be a professional athlete. Oh, oh great. You know, what's your sport? And they say, oh, well, I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I think I'll win a few races and then I'll start to train really hard. Then, then, then I might, might get a coach and I might worry about my sleep. And you would be leaving thinking, that poor girl guy, I don't hold out much hope for them being particularly successful. But that's what we so often do in business. We think, well, when I've got 100,000 turnover, when my team is more than 50 people, when I have a team, then magically all my behaviours are going to align and then I'll find it easy to do all the things I know I should be doing, but I don't. So what Feeling Forwards does is it takes you in a step-by-step -step process in the book, but it takes you through, well, you need to harness the emotion of being that person now because what an athlete, a successful one does, not like our friend's daughter, son, is that they behave like a champion before they've ever won a race. They may even say famously like Muhammad Ali, I, I am the greatest champion. And so many people don't know he said that before he'd won a single championship. Mm. But he believed, he felt as though he was, he trained, he slept, and it was that emotional that emotional journey that carries him through. You can't think hope. You can't think confidence. That's where the school of positive thinking falls down. You really have to feel where you are and then behave in alignment with that. Oh, so beautifully shared. I'm a true believer that you've got to believe it to achieve it. <laughs> you know, if you don't believe Absolutely. it, if you don't believe it, why would anyone else? And you'll never get there. You've got to totally embody that. And some people find that com confronting when people go and say, I am the greatest. They'll go, oh, my goodness, particularly in Australia. It's like 
who do you think you are? But if you can't, yes. if you can't imagine yourself on the podium, you know, if you're an athlete doing that race, winning, coming first, the whole scene, then it's very unlikely that you would actually achieve that. That's so true. That is so true. Mm. Now you have transitioned from legal roles to becoming a best-selling author, which is a really interesting journey. How did your experiences in law and consulting shape your approach to success? And did they? And what did, um, how did they lead you then to, you know, implement those sort of thoughts into the success maximizer method? I love that question because that's a question people rarely ask and I, I, I wish the interviewers rarely ask and I wish they would because the interesting thing is um, I am an absolutely, totally, total failure at being the world's next Agatha Christie, which was my burning desire. So while I was legal, corporate, and having a really great, successful career in my spare time, I was writing what every, every publisher I said to thought were truly awful murder mystery books. You know, I, I had the body in the library. I had everything and absolutely no one was interested. And then I got cancer and had some other catastrophes. And when I emerged from that, I looked at the, the writing market and realised that no one was writing about how a cancer survivor thought and felt. So my first published book was a bestseller in, and published in eight countries. And, and then I went on to completely reinvent myself in that way. But what I learned, and one of the reasons why I'm always talk about the aim, not the goal, because if my if I stuck to a goal rather than a name, I would have given up writing ages ago. But when I look back over my extended career, the common theme was always I worked with people's stories. When I was a litigation lawyer, I used to listen to people's stories of what they thought had happened and then I would think about the story I wanted the judge to believe. Um, when I was in corporate, people were coming to them with their problems. I was in project management as their stories and then later I was in recruitment and executive coaching. And so I've listened to thousands of people's stories and that's really been the common thread, what I call when I'm doing my coaching, the golden thread of my life. All my decisions have been around. I've been so curious about people's stories, why some people get there, why some people don't, and then distilling that into information that other people can really practically use. Hmm. Oh, I love that. And I never would have thought about that. But that's so true, isn't it? You know, if I've been to a lawyer about something, it is, it's, it's your it's your story. It's a version of, and then um, I'm imagining on the other side, it's like, yeah, what do I do with that? How do I, how do I take that for their, for their gain? Or sometimes it's even just their, their, their story is heard. Uh, which is yes. equally important. You know, they're not necessarily wanting something from it. They're wanting someone to know about it. They're wanting it to be appreciated or valued. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So, as a thought leader in a personal uh, um, in in personal development, you emphasise the importance of aligning um, inner justification with consistent behaviour. And I think this is a really interesting concept. Would you be able to then elaborate for our listeners on this concept and and share well how is that a game changer for your clients and how can it be for our listeners today? Mm. I think the, the interesting thing about inner justification is we get so busy doing things and we go through life stages that are often expected of us from family, friends, cultural pressures that we don't often listen to that inner justification enough and even high-performing my high-performing clients, quite often they will say my inner justification is just um, it's a search for excellence or once they, they peel away the cultural expectations, then they really start to discover what makes them tick. So your inner justification could be something like um, for mine, obviously it's, it's, it's storytelling and helping people, but it, it could be also something like, whether or not you're a huge risk taker, some some people will say, well, no, I, there's no real golden thread. And then you, you look back and you think, well, you've changed careers all these times. So you're pretty fond of risk and excitement. So is the fact that you're struggling with your motivation now due to the fact that you've been in the same job for five years and when you look back at your pattern, that's out of alignment. So, of course, you're not performing at work because, because that inner justification isn't in alignment with what you're really yearning to do that's kind of the deep and meaningful inner justification then we have another level which is i 
I was coaching a, a client recently who was going for a very senior role and it was slightly outside her remit. And I find quite often, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because you've interviewed so many fabulous female entrepreneurs, but quite often women um, lose confidence if they haven't done that particular job before, whereas their yes. male counterpart just thinks, wow, I've got, a, I've got a promotion and a huge salary increase. Yes, you know, I'll work it out when I get, when I get there. Mm-hmm. So she was really nervous about the interview. So I said, okay, let's look at what you would be doing after you've got the job. So where would you go have a coffee? What would you be wearing? What would you have read the weekend before? And then let's take that person that already has the job into the interview. So I want to immerse yourself, and this is the essence of feeling forwards. I want you to immerse yourself in to the person that already has the role and then go to the interview. Mm. And she rang me back. She got, got through to the next stage. She ended up getting an even more fabulous job. But she rang me afterwards and said, I would never have performed at interview at all if we hadn't done used feeling forwards because they asked me about the competitors they asked me about the market and because Mm. I'd already done all of that because I behaved as I already had the job it was it was a breeze and I actually felt so confident taking that leap into the future and then bringing it back into the present Mm. that it was it was very very easy so if she'd stayed um if she'd stayed with that feeling that inner justification of well I haven't done the job before so I'm not feeling all that confident and I'm not mm-hmm. sure I could talk about anything anyway, it would have had a completely different result. Oh, so true. And I totally relate to that situation personally. And I'll share share that with you. But definitely that aligns with so many women that I coach around the world. It's that that differential of I want to make sure that I'm good enough and I've got all the boxes ticked before I put myself forward. Whereas men will do exactly yes. that. But generally they'll then go, Yep, I'll I'll go for it. And if I get it, well, I'm gonna to have to level up. And so there's a very big difference there. And I learned learned that personally when I went for my first CEO role. So it was probably, you know, about 13, 14 years ago and I had been a national manager and I hadn't been a CEO before and I was, you know, that time Mm. that a lot of people were going, you're not going to get it, you know, it's a huge jump and so I I didn't have many, (laughs) many supporters Uh, and then I I then went and said, all right, this is so ridiculous, I'm going to go all in and so for, for me I had to actually block out all of that and then what I did was exactly what you were sharing, Elizabeth. I then went and said, right, I'm going to prepare a poll like a booklet, like I'm going to give out to the panel of what I will do for you in your first 100 days. So I researched the company, I researched the staff, whatever. Not only did I do that, and I, I it was really amazing, Laws of Attraction, they actually asked me, well, how, how would you approach it as our CEO? And I went, well, I've actually prepared a booklet and, I'll, and I gave it out to everybody and you should have seen their faces. They're like, oh, and then I just went, you know, as, as your CEO, I will, I will, you know, approach this and this is this, of course, according to your strategic direction and so forth, uh, but this is how I'd approach it. So I actually went full in, in on that way of here I am so they could even imagine this lady mm. is, mm. is ready to go as opposed to you know before that and I know a lot of these my listeners will be thinking that before that you're like I hope they pick me who do I have to be for them to pick me what will that where will they find out that I'm not good enough not ready enough not equipped enough and I think when you stay in that sense of limit you know you're really sabotaging your own experiences it's not that you're faking it till you make it you know you obviously have to have the qualifications but you've got to interview for a reason you're already good enough because they're not going to interview you um you know if you haven't actually got got the goods if you haven't got the education or the experience so I think that such good advice for you to share with us today because I totally totally relate and it really just created a massive shift you know for my future future professional life once I, once I nailed that uh, and I know yes. all of the listeners can do that as well now mm. your podcast falling feeling forwards I love that has gained you know significant traction and I absolutely think that's fantastic so there's um can you share a few memorable moments or interviews that have stood out for you uh around how people you know feel forwards you know what is that what are the main oh. questions about personal excellence um how people go oh my goodness just like Annie Gibbons had that moment <laughs> you know have you had some shared on your podcast I love that you shared that story, but but yes, I have, and actually, it relates to the the doctorate I'm writing at the moment. It was it was a bit of an aha moment during an interview, a lovely interview I had about a year ago now, forty months with Dr. Emeka Oladobu, who is 
a doctor who was the first chiropractor who was on the Nigerian women volleyball team, but he's also has he now lives in LA and he has a coat he has a practice where he he looks after many elite athletes. And we were talking, actually we were geeking about it, um, about sports and mindset and everything after I'd finished the show and I had to paste it back in. And uh, he was talking about college um, football stars that he treats and they've usually done their knee or they've done their hands, hamstring, usual same football injuries we have in Australia. And he said the interesting thing was the kids that had come from the toughest neighbourhood that were at college on scholarship that had had overcome personal adversity to, to even be in the program, their muscles recovered quicker. Mm. than the college football stars who came from a nice family, who had not had that same level of adversity. And that started me thinking because I thought, okay, so why is that? And I thought, okay, it's it's a neuroscience thing. It's because mm. those kids spoke to themselves differently. So you can imagine if you're on track and and football stars in the in the US earn vast amounts of money. But you imagine if you're on track to be a football star and you get an injury in college and maybe it's the first injury you've ever had or it's the first setback you've had, your self-talk would be catastrophic. Yes. Oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. What about the 400 million contract I've been dreaming about for the last 10 years? Whereas the kids that have overcome adversity would think, I've overcome, you know, this is really difficult, but I've done difficult things before. What does my doctor say? I've just got to take it step by step. I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm not going to let this hold me back. I know I'm a strong person. I can draw on that. And that relates um, in terms of relating to my to, to my doctorate. I talk a lot about feel, um, quantum physics in feeling forwards, how you can actually bend time. And I show you how to do it in the book as well, which is so much fun. But I'm looking at, so how can we harness, building on all the science I studied in feeling forwards, how can we harness the power of imagination? And does that actually increase an area in your brain? There was a recent um, recent research done on how being a pathological liar actually changes the, changes the structure of your brain. Wow. And what happens is it's – and the funny thing is you think, okay, where, where does lying fit into the brain? You know, what, what section? It actually fits into the section of the brain that deals with surprisingly rules and social behaviour and etiquette. And you think, well, why would pathologically lying all the time grow the area of the brain that's actually to do with observing rules. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is if you lie all the time, it's quite exhausting for your brain because you have to remember all the lies you've told. <laughs> so, so, true. so George Santos in the States, who's now in, thankfully in a little bit of trouble about all the lies he told, which stretch back mm -hmm. to his college days. Imagine if you're on TV and someone's asking you about your childhood or your background and you're thinking, oh, now what did I say? Did I say I was on the volleyball team or the football team? And did I say I majored in um, law or, or accounting? So I'm really diving into that, but it was fascinating to, to speak with Emeka and, and see it's such practical. I mean, a lot of people talk about the body and the mind being connected, and we all know that, but to, to hear that such a strong connection I found was, was fascinating. So my podcast continues to delight and, and surprise me every time I, I interview someone. Uh, I love that. It's a joy of podcasting. I tell you what, we entertain ourselves as the host because it's just, you know, you wonder who's next and everyone has such an interesting, unique story. It's just it never ceases to delight, I'm sure, uh, with you because mm. it doesn't beat me. Uh, that's so interesting. And, and what a, um, a underlying principle there of resilience, you know, people who have built, built up resilience over years and years, it does make such a difference to how you then, um, you know, fall forward, I'll generally say, because, you know, that's it. I've backed it up before. I can do it again. I can do it again. You're doing a PhD now. And as, P, as a PhD uh, candidate, you're obviously delving way, way, way deep into performance excellence and all of this neuropsychology. Are you finding any intriguing findings or trends that, you know, what have you uncovered so far since being a PhD student that you're like, wow, this is really going to influence um, my work in the future or those that I coach? Mm. I think it's really having an even greater respect for for the power of the mind and what the what the mind can achieve. 
and looking at, um, I came across um, a, a recent research, really, which builds on an earlier experiment I referred to in Feeling Forwards, but it was a project where you always have two groups of the poor old college students. They must pay, you know, they must be, I'm sure it's one of their main forms of revenue during, you know, being guinea pigs on these the research experiments. But they had two groups of them, and one they dressed up as pilots. And the other group just wore their regular clothes. And then they took one by one each of the, the students into a flight simulator. And the ones dressed as pilots, they said, just grab the controls, you know, feel like you're using feeling forwards, basically. Imagine you're a pilot. And then when came across a screen, three or four planes flew past on their you know, simulated screen in this flight simulator. And on the side of the planes were some letters and numbers. And they were asked to read them out. Well, at the end of the experiment, and there's always a catch, and the catch really was it was an eye test. It was nothing to do with pretending to be a pilot. But what? the pilot group compared with the, the regular um, Janes and Joes that just they said just sit in the cockpit and look at the planes and read out the numbers, the pilot group outperformed by a significant amount an improvement in their eyesight hmm. instantly. So they had an eye test before they got in the flight simulator and one afterwards. And the eyesight increased. And the difference was so much. The poor old um, research people were a bit dumbfounded and they tried to do positive thinking and they, they oh. got the group dressed in their regular clothes and basically said, come on, you can do it. Get into that cockpit. Read those numbers. And their eyesight still didn't improve. But I think that that's fascinating. I mean, it's such an instant improvement, but it relates to the power of belief and I'm really building yeah. on that. In, in my dissertation because that first group, what do you have to have as a pilot? You have to have 20-20 vision. Mm -hmm. So they absorb that into their imagination and their eyesight improved. So we are so much capable of so much more than we can even in our wildest dreams imagine. And what I'm looking forward in the doctorate, and it'll be my next book as well, but really how to harness that ima imagination and make whatever you want to manifest easier and faster and really transform the life the way you you dream about yeah oh, to all our listeners seriously you can do anything and you can see why our are uh, those who succeed whether you're an athlete you know in politics you know um top business leaders everyone has a coach for a reason because it's actually getting that mindset that the success mindset really in tune with you know you believing what you can achieve and also just really fully committing, fully focusing uh, and getting so many tips from people who really are in the know with neuroscience that actually helps them have that little edge. You know, my husband often says that, you know, when because he, he's a tennis fan and when you're watching the tennis, mm. he goes, you know, they're all brilliant. There's not much difference between them. Most of it at this stage is mindset. You know, it's that when they suddenly lose a couple, they don't get rattled. They don't sort of fall apart. They then go, no, nope, I just treat mm -hmm. every single um shot as as the same you know you don't they don't sway and I find it all so fascinating so I've just loved delving into your area of expertise today Elizabeth it's so fascinating do you have a, uh, an offer or something that our audience could reach out to you uh, to receive today Yes, I do. I mean, I've been so intrigued by your your network and your tribe. So, for the first, I'll give you my um, I'll give your listeners rather the first three people that email me at elizabeth at elizabethgould dot com. I would be delighted to offer you a free one hour coaching coaching session and just come oh. come to me with something really specific. Let's talk about it for an hour, and I'll be delighted to send you a copy of my book as well. And let's, you know, I would love to hear what has resonated with everything we've spoken about during this program and let's just apply, let's develop your personal success formula as much as I can in an hour and I can give you some really practical, practical tips. Oh, what a generous offer. Thank you so much. That is so fantastic. So I'll have all of your details with this podcast for those of you listening in or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you'll be able to find out all the information to find Elizabeth, definitely check out her book, uh, Feeling Forward, because it's really going to change your life by the sounds of things. <laughs> I'm going to have to get myself a copy today. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. What a generous offer. And so I encourage all of you to jump online and reach out to Elizabeth today. Thank you so much for being on my program today. So. 
people. It's been so interesting. And everyone else, if you're having a whenitis moment, I'm going to remember that. <laughs> now the moment is now. You know, don't wait for when, when, when. Uh, jump on to your dreams. Start, start creating today. Start believing it today. And just do one little thing that's going to help shift you towards uh, your empowered future, something that you, you know, dare to dream is truly possible. Thanks, Elizabeth. It's been a pleasure, Annie. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Memoirs of Successful Women. I'm Annie Gibbons, founder and CEO of Women's Biz Global. And if you would like to fast track your future success, hop on over to womensbizglobal.com. Find out about all things Women's Biz and most importantly, take the opportunity to have a free trial of Women's Biz Tribe. I look forward to seeing you online very soon. Until next episode, bye for now.